Well, it's now seven o'clock, so let's get this started. Welcome everyone. I am Kristen Jacobson, the Assistant Director at the Westchester Public Library. And the Westchester Library, along with over 90 other Northern Illinois libraries, are thrilled to welcome John Sanford and Carl Hyacin to a program tonight. Uh, but before we begin, I wish to thank Katie McKee at Putnam, as well as Rails Reaching Across Illinois Library Systems for all that they've put into making this program possible. I also wish to thank Donna and Rachel Blomquist of the LaSalle Public Library. They are our backup hosts should we need them. A special thanks go to my director, Fidencio Marbella, as well as two of our managers who are the best indispensable Zoom jockeys around, Patrick Callahan and Ryan Flores. They have all put in many, many hours to put this event together, um, and I guarantee it's going to be great. Thanks go out also to Anderson's Bookshop, who is our bookseller for this event. If any of you would like to purchase a copy of Ocean Prey with a book plate signed by Mr. Sanford, please click on the link in the chat box and be sure to use the code LIBRARY, all in capital letters, to take advantage of this um, when you're checking out. All right, with all that out of the way, we're finally on to the reason we're all here. We are very fortunate to welcome two uh, New York Times best-selling authors, as I said, John Sanford and Carl Hyacin. Um, they are wonderful authors of wonderful, can't put them down, thrillers. Mr. Sanford has received many awards, including the Pulitzer Prize. He has off authored more than 40 books, including more than 30 in the Prey series. I know several people who have read them from beginning to end, uh, one person more than once, and is anxiously awaiting um, reading Ocean Prey, which just came out yesterday. Yay! Carl Hyacin will be leading a discussion with John tonight. I personally started reading Carl's books over 20 years ago. I recall reading his children's book, Hoot, to a classroom of third grade readers. And Hoot is one of those rare books that I believe is even more relevant now than it was when it was first published, as it has to do with rescuing some endangered animals. But of course, tonight's program is not about children's books as much as I would like it to be because I'm a children's librarian. But tonight is going to be about the adult books that John and Carl have written. And most recently, John's Ocean Prey, which will be the subject of most of tonight's talk. Um, and now over to John and Sanford. Everybody sit back and enjoy. It looks to be a really fun conversation. To you, thank you. Hey, John. Hey, Carl, how you doing? Should we tell them how long ago we met? Oh my God, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was... 1976, it was July 19. 76 when I when I started at the Herald's uh, Broward office uh, and you were one of my editors so right. don't do the math but it was a long damn time ago yeah it's like 45 years now it's like yeah. amazing. we haven't aged a bit we look exactly the same exactly that's I mean we're exactly the same in all ways I have to say <laughs> uh, when you came there uh where were you coming from? You were coming from someplace up north, right? It I was coming from a small, small newspaper. It was called Coco Today, and it became Florida Today. But it was the it was the template for USA Today. It was sort of the experimental version of that. That was my first newspaper job, and I was there for about two and a half years. And then you know, I was I was you know born in South Florida, and so I, I had a chance to go back to the Herald. So that's that's how we met. You were on the, uh, the city desk in Broward, and I was the I was the new reporter, and I had to deal with your assignment. Did you want, do you want to tell the, the horseshit story? Or do you want me to? No, you go ahead and tell me. I, I've got a follow up to the horseshit story. Okay. Well, one, when you're the new reporter, you get weekends and John was in there on a weekend and I came in and we had nothing put in the paper the next day. And, and so we're always looking for some soft feature that you could write, you know, you could write a fair amount, fill up some of the paper. And, 
and and I remember John said, you know what, I always want, he said, I've always wondered what happens when you, at the racetrack, the Gulfstream Park wasn't far from there, and said, what do, what do they do with all the horse manure at the racetrack? They must have tons and tons of horse manure, and I and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do, and he said, I want, drive out, drive to Gulfstream and, and find out what happens to all the horse shit, so I literally get in my car, I drive to Gulfstream, I got a tour of the stables and, and I, we, what did we find out? It we all went to mushroom farms. It was something pretty interesting. It actually turned out to be an interesting story, but that was what, that was the kind of thing that uh, happened on a slow Sunday in, at the, at, at the, in the Broward uh, News Bureau. And so I wrote the story. What's your follow-up to it? Well, my, follow, my follow-up is that, that uh, uh, we were always desperate for copy in the Broward Bureau because we had your own, own section that had to fill up. But if I remember right, that story was stolen by the Miami, by the main edition, and may even have run on the front page. And I think, I think, I think, I remember, I think it will. <laughs> the other thing Serves I you right. Serves you right for sending me to the to you've horse track. Been, you've been complaining about it now for 45 years. <laughs> well, my follow-up story was that uh, there was another very... Uh, talented writer there at the same time as you were named Fred Grimm. Yep. And, and Fred also became a columnist at the Miami Herald for a long time. And, and uh, uh, I came in on a weekend and Fred was there, not you. And uh, we were desperate for copy. And I said, you know, I just saw this guy standing down on the highway uh, selling these big bullhorns that, you know, were mounted on stuff. That sounds like interesting to me. Why don't you go down there? And Fred pleaded with me not to send him down to do a story about a guy who's selling uh, uh, bullhorns on A1A. So he went and did it. The story was okay. I mean, it was actually pretty good. And, uh, but the thing is, is that when I left the Broward Bureau, uh, the tradition was you'd always give a guy a gift when he left. Well, Fred went down and bought a set of bullhorns after collecting money from the entire, from the entire place. And they're now hanging on my wall. They're 45 years later, they're hanging. Now here's, but here's the real follow-up on that. I think that you were in the Broward Bureau for about 15 minutes. And, and it was because you were just obviously a very talented writer right from the start. It always seemed to me that in, in trying to become a novelist that I had a longer struggle than you did because it was I started publishing several years after you did. In fact, I stole your, your agent, uh, Esther Newberg. Is it, were you able to write because you were talented as a kid, or it was it is it persistence? Was well, it was something I I'd always wanted to do. I, when I was in college, I had sort of worked as a, as a as a ghostwriter on on two books that actually got published, two novels. So I had a little bit of confidence going in, but it was always something. And I always wanted to write satire. When I was in college, I wrote satirical political columns. It was the age of Nixon and Watergate, and the end of Vietnam, and everything. So I knew I, I wanted to write my own books. And at the Herald, I met Bill Montalbano, who was an incredibly gifted writer and, and a foreign correspondent. And we ended up doing three thrillers. To, you know, they were pretty traditional thrillers, um, sort of stuff out of our own reporting notebook. And then after those three, I decided I wanted to try to do it myself. So it was really, it took, it did take a while, John, but it was something I knew I wanted to do. But I, I think I did it because it would, I think it's become sort of an obsession. And also, you know this from being in the newspaper business, there's, you're in the newsroom all day and, and there's so much you can put in the paper, but there's so much more that you know that you, you can't put in the paper. The, the whole story, the whole tapestry behind a story, which you can do in a novel and you can, and, and you can uh, it's not that you're embroidering, it's you're giving the whole big picture. And it's something you miss when you have to, you know, you have to turn in, you got 500 words, you got a half hour to write it, and here's where it's going in the paper. Well, you just, I think it builds up like a, a tea kettle where you want, no, there's more and you want to write. I don't know how it worked for you. I mean, you left the Herald and you went up to the Pioneer Press and you, you know, you want to pull it surprise for those magnificent columns. But at the end, you still wanted, there were, you still had more to write. And that's, and that's, I think, when you started the first Lucas Davenport books. But here's the new one, which I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up for you that's on sale now. I got an early copy because that's what they do. But I, I mean, I, I think, and remember, we talked, Esther had been my Bill agent for me and Bill for, for since 1979. And I remember when you wanted to write, we talked about it. And, and then, and, and I, I, you didn't steal me because I told her she should call you. And it, it, and and I don't think she's ever ever regretted it. But you were serious. You were dead serious about it. I think 
But the thing is, we're busy. We had busy lives. We're raising kids. You know, you work at a newspaper all day and you go home at night and you go lock yourself in a room to write some book that you hope is going to be published. But that's how it went. Well, I, I will tell you that people have asked me what was my direct impetus for actually starting to write novels. And I told them my direct impetus was that I won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for reporting and, and um, I got a $50 a week raise, which was $2,500 a year. Well, I had two kids and a wife, all who wanted to go to the University of Minnesota and, and I needed money. And so I always wanted to write novels, uh, but I actually wrote a book on plastic surgery first, just desperate for money. And then I wrote a book on art because I was desperate for money. Right. Then I wrote a novel and I sent it to Esther and she said, I don't like it. And she sent it back. But then she told me, you know, she thought I could make a living at it. Uh, so I went ahead and did that. Uh, I found that the newspaper business was this incredible gold mine of stuff that you can use. And, and you're right. A lot of the stuff you just can't, uh, somehow you just can't put a newspaper story. Sometimes you can but a lot of times you can't. I happen to have a book here uh, that I, I want to tell this story to. This book is called Razor Girl <laughs> and it's by, by Carl Hyacin. <laughs> I know what you're stuck in it. Yes. So, so the thing is, is that Carl wrote a story about this young woman who sort of wanted to neaten up her physique a little bit with a razor. Uh, what I'm talking about is that uh, she was going to uh, remove her pubic hair with a razor. Uh, while driving. While driving. Uh, you would think that this would be something you wouldn't normally occur to you. But, but Carl didn't actually make this up. This did not spring out of his forehead. Right. This was actually, this was actually a news story in South Florida. And the one thing about South Florida is, is if you don't think it can happen anywhere, it'll happen in South Florida. Yes, yeah, she crashed into the car of header, mile marker 21 down in the Keys. She was shaving and driving at the same time. And she crashed into a car full of tourists. <laughs> and she still had the razor in her hand when the trooper got. <laughs> so the thing that the thing that I was sort of curious about, and I'm, I may have this wrong because it's been a long time since this happened, but it seemed to me like she was she was doing this because she was going on a date. She was going on a date, and the, but her husband was with her. Her her ex, I believe it was her ex husband, was in the car next to her, and she was trying to have him hold the wheel. I'm not lying. While she shade but she still had her foot on the accelerator and crashed into the nobody was hurt but but and, and dave barry likes to point out that she was not from florida she was from indy she was somewhere in the, from the midwest indiana somewhere dave barry says it's it's only fair that you point out she was not a florida right but she came to florida to do it she came to florida and and romance bloomed and she just wanted to uh in, in the herald the herald being a family newspaper i think it said something like she was uh, sh she was shaving her bikini area. That was the best they could come. <laughs> well, I, I get the point across. You know, but the thing is, is that you and I, more than any other thriller writers that I can think of, uh, have emphasized the stupidity of many of our criminals uh, because because that was sort of our experience as newspaper. Oh my God! Yeah, that, that's that's what I always tell. The, the prisons are full for a reason. And, and and they and some of the, I mean obviously some of the stories are tragic the backstories are tragic and sad but others are just plain stupid they arrested a guy a couple months in Florida in Florida at a Walmart I I didn't see the Frozen movies the, but there's I guess some characters and they make stuffed animals out of these characters beloved children's characters and they had them on display in Walmart and the guy was arrested for having sex with one of the stuffed Frozen character i forget which one it wasn't elsa it was or whoever it was somebody else anyway and they pull him apart and they're trying to arrest him and he screams and he jumps on another one of the stuffed animals and they drag it to drag him out of walmart this poor love struck perv but it was i can't in the freaking but, walmart but, but it was in walmart, walmart you know so I mean, it's but it's if you if you invent it if you and i put that as a scene in a novel i bet Neil, your editor, or Peter, my editor, would probably shoot us a notepad saying, okay, now you've, you've gone too far. It's, right. it's far. You can't go any farther. Well, I had a guy in, in St. Paul who decided to break into a restaurant, and the best way he could do it was to cry, crawl down the chimney, blow a barbecue, and he got stuck. 
and and uh, they they had to drag him out. Uh, he was screaming when they fired up the thing the next morning, and and because he was stuck on the chimney, and um, so then he goes down in the books and Smokey Joe, because <laughs> he was completely screwed up, and and so you ask yourself, I mean, give me a break. How does this happen? And then, uh, and like you said. Uh, a lot of the other stupid stories turn out to be terribly tragic because somebody did something really stupid that turned out to be awful. Well, to tell me if you've had this experience. I mean, you, you and I were both in newsrooms for a long time. And, and I mean, I'm convinced that stories that I probably wrote back when I was working with you and I, that I may have thought nothing of at the time. I mean, you're on deadline, you're just knocking the stuff out. But I find bits and pieces and fragments and moments popping into my head while I'm while I'm working on a piece of fiction where it, it'll just have jarred something or some moment where it fits that scene or it fits that transition in a chapter. And it's almost a subconscious thing, but you you have this repository of, of, of stuff because you, you I think most journalists, you know, do have good memories and you just sort of catalog as you go along. And, and that goes for the bad, the bad stuff you see as well as the good stuff you see. But I think it influences everything we write. Yeah, I think so. I was asked once, you know, because I've written some pretty ugly scenes in the, in the Davenport books, uh, you know, <laughs> where all that comes from. And, and uh, do I just make it up? You know, my, some kind of a perv myself because, I, you know, I'm making this stuff up. Well, one of the first things, one of the first things I did as a reporter uh, in Fort Lauderdale, actually, I, I don't know why I was on that story, but a, a young girl was kidnapped, raped, murdered. I mean, she was like six or seven, and she was thrown down an embankment in a canal. She didn't go into the canal. She was on the. Embankment. I was there when that that story happened, John. She was out there for like a week, and yeah, and and and, and I went out and looked when the cops were there, and I'm thinking it doesn't get much worse. And another time when I was working in 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 South Dade County. Uh, way down by Florida City, uh, I was working with a photographer who had a radio and we got a police call that a girl had drowned. And so they have these uh, gravel pits down there that are full of water and uh, they're, they're borrow pits. But at any rate, she had drowned in a borrow pit. Uh, some other little kid, I, my photographer and I arrived there and some other little kid uh, went and told her mother that her daughter had drowned. And the mother looked out the window and she saw all the cop cars over by that pit. And she started screaming and she ran across to us, uh, screaming about her girl. And uh, she was barefoot running across this coral field. And when she got to us, her, her feet had been shredded. And this is like the third story I did for the Miami Herald. I'd done some bad stories in, in Missouri, but you don't see people bleed that often. And all of that stuff sticks in your head. So when you come to an ugly scene to write, you're manipulating everything around, but a lot of it you've seen. You've seen the blood and you've seen the bodies lying in the street and you've seen the people with the plastic covers over the top of them and all that kind of stuff. And um, it, it, uh, it has an effect on what you write. I think I tell people, and maybe you, maybe you agree or not, I, I think the part of why we do what we do, not only we're lucky to have the readers and we're lucky to be successful and we love all that part of it. But I do think part of it is uh, psychotherapeutic. Uh, I mean, not that we're, you know, we were shot at and, and, and we weren't war correspondents, but I just think the general weight of being in the news business when, when most of the time the stories don't have a happy ending, they just don't. And, and to some extent as novelists, we get to control who lives and dies and we get to write our own endings and, and um, you, you don't get to do it in real life. And, to, and the, the story you mentioned, you know, you and I were both in the newsroom the day when that girl was found. She'd been kidnapped from a bowling alley and uh, the little girl in Broward. And, and we were both there and I forget the photographer, you might remember who it was, but he came in with the photos when they found her. And I'll never forget, we couldn't run any of them. Yeah. Uh, we, couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't publish any of them, but that they, they, you know how it was, they kind of they throw them on the, the city desk, the table, and you're sitting there. I don't care how old are you or how long you've been in the business or what you've seen or you haven't seen, but it, it messes you up. And, and I think to some extent, I think the writing is something we, we have to do. I mean, the, the, the fiction is something we have to do. But I did, you know, one thing I want to talk about Ocean Praise because 
it starts off in my hometown of Lauderdale and, and you've obviously gone back there. You probably spent more time there now than I have. I, I you know, I, I, I hadn't been back in a while, but, but it was familiar streets, the neighborhoods, the, you know, Las Olas, all the stuff, you know, my, my dad's office was right downtown in the area, some of the areas you described in the intercoastal waterway. And it was like going, it, it was like going home. It was like when I remember reading uh, McDonald to one of the first Travis McGee novels and he had the houseboat, the busted flush was at Bahia Mar. And I remember saying, that's so cool. I know right where, I know right where that is. I know where that, those docks are. And that's how I felt when I was reading this. Cause uh, even though it's a harrowing opening to the book, um, uh, you, you know, knew where all the pieces were, you know, yeah. uh, Travis McGee was one of my favorites and uh, living on the busted flush, which I think that he named after the fact that he won the boat in a, in a poker game. And, that's, and that was the lore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, and I was aware of the busted flush when I, when I uh, wrote that piece and I was around Bahia Mar quite a bit uh, when I was doing the research, I actually went to the Lauderdale boat show as part uh -huh. of the research. And, and I mean, it's an amazing event. And I, I, I am hoping to go back again this year because I just thought the event was so amazing. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't work for another book for me, but I just love going to that kind of spectacle. But, but Fort Lauderdale is an amazing place. It, it um, our boat, the boat that I have is parked up way at the end of the New River. So every time we go out to the ocean, we, we go through those houses. And uh, a guy pointed out one of the houses. It looked like a, uh, it looked like the Alamo kind of on the New River. And the question, he said, you know why that looks like the Alamo? And I said, no, and he said, because it's owned by the guy who was the owner of Taco Bell, <laughs> the Taco Bell restaurants. I didn't get to put that in the book, but you know, sitting here thinking about it, I kind of wish I had. It, it was it was sort of an interesting story. You know who had a home right near where your boat is for for years? It was a big celebrity thing. Evil Knievel. Yeah. Evil, Evil Knievel had a big mansion right on right on the intercoastal there. So yeah, I mean, I just as a Floridian, I loved it. But also, it's just a great, you know, uh, a tropical, mysterious setting. Especially you know when you have when you're dealing, you have smugglers obviously sophisticated uh, smuggling thing which is still going on big time um not not like in the 70s it's not you know yeah. uh, coke and weed sort of stuff that we were used to but um i just i i got into it right away because i was like I, I know this place and i thought i thought you must have come back and spent some time down there you know, one of the things that I found as a writer, and I don't know if this is the same, I find that my writing works better if I actually looked at the place where it's set. Uh, in other words, um, if, if I go to Bahia Mar and look at Bahia Mar, then I can write Bahia Mar better than if I go to Google and look at Google Streets or something like that or whatever that's called, or, or look, at, uh, look at a map or something like that. If I can actually see it, because you usually wind up picking out idiosyncrasies that actually make the story seem alive when you're writing it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. It's, it's my own uh, uh, social ineptitude makes me reluctant to even just, like you go to the boat show, I did when I was a kid, but I, I can't imagine going to the boat show now, you know, it would just, uh, I don't know why, it's just too many, you know, too many people. I, I just spent, you know, three days down the middle of the Everglades and you know, when we chanced upon another boat, I would, I would be grievously sad that we saw another human being in another boat in the middle of nowhere, you know. Well, so, then the, the boat show might not be your thing. No, it might not. There, 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 there were two events at the boat show that just amazed me. One of them were three Lamborghinis went by in a row. One of them was red, one of them was banana yellow, and the other one was lime green. And they were going at about a mile and a half an hour because of the traffic jam. And I mean, here are these cars that look like that. I mean, a racetrack, and they're not going anyplace. The other thing was, is that there was this huge yacht there, and somebody said, one of the boat people said, that it took 40,000 gallons of diesel to run the but boat. But that the book, yeah. $160,000 to fill it up one time. And I, I just, you know, you say, okay, uh, maybe there is some reason to, uh, you know, tax billionaires at 99%. Yeah. It just, Again, uh, you can spend that kind of dough gassing up a boat. Yeah, the, the, anything, you know, we both, I think journalists love excess in terms of being, as witnesses to it. When, I mean, you see the Lambos, you know, that was, you know, speaking of, that was the perfect Florida story after the pandemic broke out and the PPE money starts coming in that some, 
somebody in South Florida says, this might be a good way. And to set up, you know, the, the, the sort of a boat, inflated the number of employees have got a big check from the government. The first thing he does, he goes out and buys a purple Lambo with yeah. it. And he gets, you know, he gets busted in like 30 minutes and he's scratching his head going, God, what, where did it go wrong? But in South Florida, that seems like a good idea. Yeah, right. okay. yeah. well, that, that made it, that made, you know, I, I've wanted to write for years. I've wanted to write a, a, a book set in, in South Florida and I finally got it done. And uh, it, it, uh, it's just such a, it's just such an interesting place. I, 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 my boat's still there. I'm going to go there on the 1st of May. I'm going to float down the new river again. And, and uh, uh, you know, who knows, maybe another, maybe another book will come out of it. I don't mean to intrude on your territory, but it's like, no, no, not at all. You know, like I said, I, um, the last book that I wrote was set in the Palm Beach, Mar-a-Lago, uh, no you. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. I, and I did not spend a huge amount of time down there, but I spent enough. And- uh, Did you and ever see a snake? Pardon? Did you ever see a snake? One of the big pythons? Yeah. No, I've been on a couple python hunts and we have not caught any, but I, my friend got about a 15 footer the other day. I, um, I, I've, I know many people who are involved in the hunting and I would love to get, you know, be there. Um, but uh, no, I haven't there, but there, I, they'll be there. They'll, they're on their way. For people who don't know what we're talking about, Carl's last book involved in a counter between a, uh, a 20 foot long uh, Burmese python and a, and a heiress from, uh, an elderly heiress from Palm Beach. Uh, and it worked out well for one of them for a while, but-, but, uh, yeah, but it, it, was ta it was tastefully rendered. I think it was tasteful, yeah. It was. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, what can you say? But, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, before the book came out, the, the, the publicist, Knopf, uh, Paul Bogarts, had come down here with his family and he was going out, he was going to take a bunch of relatives out on an airboat. When, you know, you can come down and you hire these guys and they take you on these great air bike runs through the Everglades. And he had read the manuscript and he thought, as usual, as I'm sure Neil thinks about you, that you're just, you've really, you know, you've lost it just making this stuff up. So he's out there with his family and the guy, you know, the dude, you can imagine these guys that run the airboats, wheels does a, a, a like a 180, so stay right in the boat and it leaps out of the freaking boat. And Paul starts taking pictures. The guy jumps on a python. It wasn't huge, but they may be 10 feet something. And he's wrestling around. He holds it up very proudly for his clients to see. And it was a real python. And, you know, there's a bounty on them. You get it's per foot. And so it was like a couple hundred dollars tip for the guy, Bo, and he wrestles it and he calls another guy. They transferred, Paul's calling me saying, you can't believe what happened. <laughs> but so it was, I thought it was wonderful. I just wish I'd been on, on the boat. Uh, you know, you and I were once on a boat and almost got hit by lightning. Uh, I took you out. <laughs> yeah, you took me out. And, uh, and for, Carl was standing in the front of the boat holding a, uh, a 15 foot, carbon fiber pole or something like that as we yeah, were pushing pole, yeah. bonefish. And uh, we saw, uh, I think, a, a squall line going across the coast, but like 10 miles away. And all of a sudden we started getting this electric hum. It was buzzing, we were, the pole was buzzing. That's right. Through the water. And uh, we didn't get hit, but we, being reporters, called up the National Weather Service when we got back to the office and said, what the hell was that? And they said, well, you were about to get hit by lightning. That was a precursor wave or something like that. <laughs> Do and, you remember, I think, I think when that hit, we were in Biscayne Bay, and I think we ran to one of the stilt houses, didn't Back in, before, before Andrew took out most of the stilt, Hurricane Andrew, um, there were quite a few stilt houses in Biscayne Bay, and I think we ran to one of them and hit out there, I think. Get out of it. We, there's still stilt houses out there. We went by the... the there's a handful, yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and I don't know, they, they seem kind of weird to me, but maybe not. It seemed like a place you might go and light up some weed and take a bath <laughs> and have a few no, more. No, that lightning, that lightning scares the hell out of me. I, I, I should have, I don't know how I didn't run away faster. I shouldn't have put you in that in that position. Well, we were a long way from the storm, but I mean, it was an interesting yeah. experience. It's just something that's always stuck in my head. I've never been able to use it, but... Uh, you know, yeah. there. Well, um, what is, now you, I was telling this story before we, we, we went live, but I'm going to tell it again, but many years ago, I got to be more than 20 years ago. I was on a book tour and I come through Minneapolis and you were nice enough to drive over from St. Paul. We're sitting in 
the bar, the hotel, and you're saying, this is it, one more book and I'm done. I can, I can quit, I can retire, I've got everything lined up, I've been doing smart things. And, and you've written, I don't know, 30 books and 35 books. And you were, had me convinced that, yeah, I'm done with that. I've done what I wanted to do. I'm just- Not enough money. You know, what the heck? I'm you, you, that's exactly what you said, by the way. I'm not going to lie. You said, this is the number I'm looking for. I'm going to be there after the next book. And, uh, and, and, yeah, and here we are. That's right. <laughs> what a, I'm going to hold something up. I don't know if they can see it on this thing. This is, uh, this is the book that I finished writing Monday. I sent it to New York on Monday. And my editor, Neil Nyron, said that uh, I needed to punch up the last chapter. And this is the last chapter. It's got all got red stuff all over it before I punched it up. So uh, my wife is looking at it right now and I'm gonna send it off to New York tonight and, and sub out the, the last chapter. But uh, I, 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 I'm afraid that a lot of people who would like to be writers think that you sit down at a typewriter and type or a computer and type. And that's pretty much it, but it's a lot of work. It is no, my, I'm miserable most of the time. I, yeah, that's, I that accounts for some of my social history. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a piece of you every time and it's agonizing, and especially if you come out of the business, we came out of, you know, you're used to getting edited. You're used to getting tough edits and stories thrown back at you. And I mean, you're used to that part, but you become your own toughest critic and editor, I, I think. And you're, you're hard on yourself and every sentence could be better. Every character could be sharper. Every bit of dialogue could be punched, as you said, I do just like you punch it, you know, you're punching it up until the minute you release it for publication, you're still reaching for it saying, I know I can make it better. And we're very lucky to have, you know, to be in this business and to have a great agent, great editors and all that, but it's, it doesn't get any, I don't know about you, it doesn't get any easier. And, it doesn't get any easier. One of the things about the newspaper business that, that I think that a lot of, that discourages a lot of talented writers who are in the newspaper business for writing novels, so when you're in the newspaper business, the story ends pretty quickly, especially for people like me. I, I mean, I was a general assignment reporter most of the time, which meant that I went out, did a story that day. I came back, finished it in two hours, and I'm, and I'm done. I go home. I don't have the story hanging over my head. Now, uh, I write virtually every day of the year, and, and uh, I, I don't really take a lot of time off. No, you're insanely prolific. In fact, it's disgusting how prolific you are. I do think there's a, some pathology at work because I feel you make the rest of us feel like sloths. Um, I mean, I feel guilty taking a day off or doing something, but there are days, I don't know if you, you may be, I think you're definitely more disciplined, but I mean, there are days when I feel lucky to get a couple of decent paragraphs out. And then there are days when it flows better and it's, you know, you're, you, you work your way through. See, but there are days when I just say, that's it. I, I got to stop. I, it's, it's for now on, it's just crap. But then you look at somebody like Stephen King. Uh, that's now, a, Stephen King, I don't know how he does it. So I don't know how he does it. He, that, he, that, he's a phenomenon. And, and, and I mean, I don't know. And the level of energy and passion that he has for writing, the stuff that he's written about being a writer is some of the best stuff I've ever read. Sort of teaching part, the craft of writing, which... I think a lot of newspaper people don't think about. They see another newspaper person who's doing well or started writing novel and think, I can do that. But the, the, the care that you, you have to, with the craft of writing that you don't necessarily have the luxury of when you're on deadline, you got an editor breathing over your shoulder. You, they're just, you can't worry over an adjective for more than about a millisecond. But right. when you've you're, you got a contract and someone's expecting a book in a certain level, you, you, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a sentence I wrote, thinking, God, that was shitty. I got to fix that tomorrow. I, I don't know well, if you that's, that's, what I, that's what I did last night when Neil told me I really needed to punch up the last chapter um, because it was sort of flat. The rest of the book he liked a lot. The last chapter he just said was a little flat. So last night I'm laying in bed. I'm thinking, you know, what do I do to get rid of that flatness? Because I kind of agreed with him, actually. I, I kind of finished the book in a hurry. And, um, and so there were just a whole bunch of things. And now the chapter resembles the first version, but it's not much alike because I just kind of laid there and I kind of picked up a lot of stuff that I needed to do. You know, some of the stuff that you do is like, is like you add a little bit of dialogue, a little bit of stress between characters and stuff like that. And you actually think about all those things about, you know, how am I going to fix this particular little section and, 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 and give it more presence and, and, and you know, more vitality. So um, I think that 
aren't, isn't somebody supposed to show up pretty soon and start asking us questions? <laughs> Maybe we put them all to sleep, man. <laughs> it's, it's it's probably just probably all off. Not at off, I think, over there. No. Um, do you like getting, you know, I have to say something. I don't know if it's been your experience. And it was when I was working with Neil and it's been when, when I was working with Sunny Meta and with Peter now. It, here's the problem is when they, when they tell you something like that, they're usually right. Yeah. They're well, usually right. When my wife tells me something like that, she's usually right. I mean, because she reads all the stuff and, and you know, as I'm writing it, and, and I've actually written three books, which are children's books. Right. But the, but the, 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 um, they're right. And so, so then you've got, at least you've got to pay attention to it. And that's and, exactly right. You do. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, you know, whatever comes out of that is what comes out of it. But, um, uh, you know, they're not actually rejecting books yet, so that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you got to sweat that too much. Okay. Hi, Kristen. We see Kristen. Hi there. You gentlemen are so entertaining. Thank you so much for sharing some great stories. Um, our listeners and, and uh, viewers tonight have put in some great questions in the chat. Um, one of them is that the fascinating character Letty is the main character in the upcoming book. Are you able to respond to that? Uh, yeah, she's Davenport's daughter. Right. Uh, she had a rather, uh, she had an extremely harsh youth. Uh, she essentially supported her mother who was a terminal alcoholic or she would have been a terminal alcoholic if she hadn't been murdered, which is when Davenport met Letty. But, but from the time Letty was about five to the time she was about 12, she supported the family by trapping out in the far most cold and desolate area of Minnesota. And, and uh, so she grew up uh, as somebody who believed in guns and who, uh, who trafficked in guns and who has now become a rather elegant young lady with this, with this strange background. And, uh, and she, uh, through the intercession of her father, Lucas Davenport, who's in the Prey novels, gets a job in Washington, which she doesn't like. But then the person that she's working for says, I think I have an assignment that you will like. And so the rest of the novel, which is a straight up thriller, is set in uh, South Texas, right down on the border. And uh, I think it's pretty good. And, and I know that my editor liked it a lot, with the exception of you know, some things in the last chapter. It was flat. It was flat. It was flat. So you've got a flat tire there, John. It's like it's a. So you said it just went to, it's going to the publisher this week for the final. Um, when will it be published? When will it be out? April of next year. A year from, we will definitely usually, look forward to it. Usually the one that I turn in in April comes out in the autumn, but apparently they want to do something a little more with this one uh, to give it a little bit bigger push. So that so that uh, that's that's what they say in any case, and so it will apparently be coming out of April of next year. Excellent. We'll look forward to it. Some of our reader, our watchers, are asking a question of Carl. Carl, what is that object behind you? <laughs> that is. Um, asked that, isn't it? <laughs> I think she that, made that is actually a roadkill uh, sculpture that a friend of mine, who's a dentist on Big Pine Key. Uh, does in his spare time, uh, and, and you know, I have a character called Skink who likes roadkill. So Fred made that for me, and I put in an order for because I raised a couple of raccoons. I like raccoons, so I thought it'd be cool to have. That's raccoon bird. It's that's a raccoon skull uh, that he got off a, a, a unfortunate roadkill raccoon somewhere down in the Keys. And um, and my wife, it was very briefly in the main part of the house it was there for about 30 seconds and she said no no it was it. so but anyway this is i think fitting i think your wife has good taste <laughs> yeah, she, she moved it out of there pretty quick not to leave you out john um we have a question who is that on the poster behind you uh there are two posters behind me i guess one of them is, uh, this one over here is by a Mexican artist. It's a village uh, thing. And this one, I'm an amateur painter. And I am uh, painting a piece for my wife here that involves a friend of hers from Los Angeles who's a street person. And she has been supporting him for more than 20 years now. Uh, he just lives full-time on the streets. He has a schizophrenia problem. 
uh, nice guy, but but he has that problem, and she has been taking care of him for twenty some years, and um, and so I started putting this painting together, and that is a dog of hers at the bottom, which I, which I, it looks funny right now, but that it's an underpainting that's going on there, so that's what that is. Cool, fascinating. You look at well, the dichotomy so though between that classy answer that he gave, and I'm talking about it, a dead raccoon behind me. Can you just do you see the? You I see why he, you see why he's so successful. I, think I wasn't going to mention of, anything. <laughs> sort of characterizes our lives, I think. It's like it's, <laughs> uh, so many of the people that wrote in questions, of course, are librarians. Uh, we have some from Helen Plum Library, Sycamore Library, Downers Grove Library, Poplar Creek Library that are asking about how you do your research. Um, are your plots based on real crimes? Um, do you have to, do you have a specific process that you develop your characters? How do you come up with your names? It goes on and on and on. I mean, everybody is just so curious how you two do your research and how you come up with these stories that you write. Carl, go ahead. Well, I think we, I think we talked about some of it. Some of it's sort of in our memories and John does a lot of on the ground research. I think his stories require a lot more because my, my books are always set in Florida. It's the only place I've ever lived and the only place I know anything about. And, um, and, and I, I mean, I don't have to do that much research. I'm here all the time, but, but, but John actually takes it serious and almost in a scholarly way. And the way, the way Dutch Leonard did and the way a lot of great thriller writers do. I mean, and, and uh, even for instance, like in, in, in Ocean Prey, you know, he went back, even though he could have written those scenes, he had the boat show scene, a lot of the cool stuff in the beginning in Port Everglades from the Coast Guard station, which we won't give away everything that's happening, but all that stuff you probably could have done from Google or from memory, from being there, but it does help to be there. And, and that, I mean, it, that, and it's a lot of work. I mean, I, the plots, I don't know, the, the crimes themselves, John, do you, I mean, do you, do you clip stories? Do you, I mean, do you, do you base a novel? Does a particular crime happen and you say, I can turn that into a novel or a storyline for a novel? It's not a, that a particular crime happens. It's, that, uh, it's kind of an accumulation of crimes. Um, one of the things, you know, we, we, we talked about uh, Stephen King just for a moment, and it, and it has occurred to me in the past that we do, the two of us, something that Stephen King uh, uh, sort of taught me to do. And, and that is, is that if you look at a lot of contemporary thriller writers who are especially writing uh, uh, stories about guys who are secret agents or guys who are former military people, guys who are, uh, they're, they're dealing with people who are so unbelievably evil that, that you can't hardly, you know, understand what's going through their heads. And then, and then these guys are so unbelievably tough that you can't, uh, you know, they're just on the edge of believability. But there are many people out there and they're quite successful with these guys. But you and I and Stephen King, not, not to compare us, but I mean, because we're all pretty different. Uh, you can go to the places that we go to and you can see the things that we see. And I think that that's a strength. And, and that's why I do that kind of research. I once had a guy tell me that you couldn't get off the street at this particular place, a cop, in fact, who actually patrolled it. And I said, sure you can. There's a place just short of the golf course where you can turn off that street. And he said, oh, you're right. And, and, uh, and that's because I drove it to look at it. And the thing is, is that I think that that does give it this kind of tactile sense that when you, when you actually look at something and, and then you report it. And so I'm doing somewhat like I, the, kind of the same things I did when I was writing a setting when I was a reporter. And you did the same thing. You were extremely good at it. That was, that was why you were only in Fort Lauderdale for 15 minutes. Uh, and, and so uh, it was, um, I, think, I, I think that maybe the, the villains are kind of complexes in our head, but they're mostly based on real people. They're not based on some imaginary uh, Osama bin Laden, some follower of Osama, but they're, they're, they're more real They're the people who, you know, hang out at the local bar. There are people who get in trouble doing something else and they're bad people, but they're not strangers to us. They're, they're people who are in our towns. And they're not, they're not indecipherable. Most criminals are not. You and I talked about this. They're, they can be bad and they can be nasty and greedy, 
but they can also at the same time have an element of stupidity or they can have weaknesses that give them away, but they're, they're not James Bond villains. You don't run into that, those people in real life, What you run into is, you know, even somebody like Escobar who was active when, you know, we were, we were but he still made a lot of mistakes he, and he still goofed up and he still, you know, you know, ended up getting shot, but you, we build them into these larger than life a lot of a lot of thrillers he's just these these like james bond sort of villains when in fact you and i both know what you know from dealing with real criminals you know <laughs> yeah. well and there are other aspects of those novels and I, I don't mean to be too critical but uh last summer i was driving down i-35 with a canoe up in the roof of my truck uh and i it started to rattle loose and i got up to port loaf push it back in the truck and i fell i lost my grip on the on the, on the canoe and I fell into a ditch. I broke my arm just below my shoulder here and I had to drive 35 miles down to a hospital to get a, to looked at it. The point being that, that it still hurts. And so in these novels, a, a lot of these other novels, you know, the guy will get shot three times but it's just a flesh wound and so he keeps going. And, <laughs> and you know, I've got a broken arm that, you know, is very skillfully repaired and I'm whining like a little girl for you know, the next year and a half. And, and, uh, the the uh, so so you know you put that kind of experience. I mean, I'm going to be able to use this broken arm sooner or later, because because it 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 says something about the fragility of somebody's body. You don't just get up and walk away. And in a Davenport book, a couple books ago, Davenport was shot in the chest, and then the book stopped, and it went several months into the future before he could resume the case. Because if you're shot in the chest, you you don't put a Band-Aid on it and walk away. So uh, so a lot of that, I think, derives from our reporting and seeing people who've been hurt. And uh, you said something earlier, by the way, that, that tipped something off in my head. Um, I did some medical reporting for a while just because I was interested in, in hospitals and stuff. And uh, I there was a case, I asked them to give me a really bad case in an emergency room so that I could see what it was like when they come into this, they call room 10, which is the big crisis room. A farmer got terribly injured. His tractor had rolled over him, but the wheel was still in gear and it cut through his butt and his leg, part of his back. Um, he was brought into the hospital and I was watching the operation when they amputated his leg and everything. And they sent a, 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 a young photographer over to take a picture of the people going in out of the room, not the actual farmer. Uh, but the photographer, she was an intern, looked into the room and then she walked away and then she quit because she said, I can't do this. And, and there is something in most reporters that can do that. I mean, I think she made a very wise decision because she couldn't do that, yeah. but most reporters can do that. And, and as bad as we felt looking at that little girl laying on the ditch, we went back to work the next day and we went back to work all those other days, you know, for hundreds of days uh, doing things that were pretty awful. And that's where a lot of the, the stuff comes from for our books. Oh, interesting, fascinating. Um, quick question for both of you. Do you prefer writing like for you, John, from the perspective of Lucas or are you more interested in writing from the criminal's mind? Uh, well, I do both. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the problem, in my view, and the way I write my books are both necessary because, because uh, getting from the criminal's perspective gets you close to the criminal. And what I try to do most of the time is make the criminal somewhat likable or at least attractive in some way to the, I mean, he's just not this terrible pervert who is, who's crazy and, no, and everybody hates immediately. So I've got a guy who's killed a lot of people a couple books ago. He winds up getting shot by Davenport and killed, but, but he's not an unattractive guy. And one of the things he does as a hobby is he builds guitars and he's good enough at it that he's actually, his guitars sell to celebrities. So, he, so he's got this ability and he's got this talent, but he also kills people. And, and, uh, and so I like having that ambiguity in the bad guys. And then because it, it makes them, I think, more real to the reader. And, and the same thing works with Davenport. So, you, you know, Davenport is so intent on catching these people, but he's also aware of these other aspects of the brain. Absolutely. Cool. I, I don't, I mean, my, 
you know, the, my novels are sort of, the, because they're satiric, I, I, a lot of the narrative tone of the novels is sort of the way I look at the world and it's twisted and cynical and, and hopefully funny sometimes. But um, I think it, it's always, I don't want to say fun, but I mean, it's, it's a cliche to say so, but when you're in the bad guy's head or from his point of view, or, you know, what it, it, you, you're, I think your adrenaline is running a little higher. It's, you get, there's a little more energy in the writing. If you're yeah. in, the, in the head of the protagonist and uh, it's someone you're familiar with, I think you, you have to watch getting too comfortable or assuming the reader knows or assumes too much about him. But okay. the, you know, bad guys are, are, are all, always fun. And in my, in my novels, at least something horrible is gonna happen to the end, but it's gonna be poetic. And, and again, tastefully rendered, and it'll be, uh, but you know, I, 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 the whole book, I spend con trying to devise the best way to get rid of the worst characters. The way that's gonna be most satisfying to me personally, it's very selfish, but in real life, that's what you secretly, we all want to happen. We don't, you, you don't want like a, a, a really bad guy to just step off a curb in chapter 25 and get hit by a bus. It's just, right not emotionally satisfying. There's gotta be some, there's gotta be a, maybe a big Python involved. You know, there's gotta be something like that. <laughs> well, that, that, bring, that brings me to the book that John uh, recently referred to, your most recent book, Carl, called Squeeze Me. And um, I wanna take the, a second to read the, um, the jacket quote. Squeeze Me is irreverent, ingenious, and uproariously entertaining. entertaining. Squeeze Me perfectly captures the absurdity of our times. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree. I enjoyed it completely. Right. It's set in Mar-a-Lago. Um, no, no, it, well, it costs, well, it costs a bella cosa. Casa, not, yeah. <laughs> there, there is, Oops, my bad. <laughs> there's, there's no um, possible way, there's no possible way <laughs> to mistake his presidential character for Donald no. Trump. No, 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 no. It was my no, no. I misspoke. It never <laughs> crossed your mind. Never crossed. Your mind. <laughs> never, not from the first word of the novel. No, it was very entertaining. So uh, thank that, you that very was, much. That's an example. What John and I were talking about something being therapeutic as well, because you, you know, you can write columns, you can get on a soapbox, you can scream and yell, but it's it's much more fun to to make other stuff happen. In fiction, you can you can just go nuts. And, and, yeah, you can. Um, I hope yeah. that it works. So, John, several of your books have been made into movies. Um, we're hoping there will be more movies, but a lot of our, our listeners tonight, Acorn Library, Sycamore Library, Frank Frankfurt, et cetera, et cetera, um, are wondering if any of these will be developed into like a TV series yeah. or... I mean, we just can't get enough of you in books. We want to, <laughs> we want to see the movies. We want to see you know, more of the. Uh... I don't care. You don't care. I, I really don't care. I mean, and people don't believe. My wife doesn't believe me, but uh -huh. I really, in my heart, don't care. I'm a book writer. Uh -huh. uh, I thought the two movies that were made uh, of my book so far really sucked. I didn't like either one of them. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, Carl actually had quite a good movie made. Uh, with one of his uh, books, and uh, but I, I, I just don't care. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, if somebody wants to pay me for a huge sum of money to make a book into a movie, that's fine. I mean, I'll take the money, but I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to oh. be the executive producer. I don't want to talk to the director. I don't want to meet the movie star. You know, I, I don't want to go to Hollywood. I don't want to do anything. I just want to do what I do, and what I do is I'm a book writer. Yeah, it's a it's a horrible process, and and John and I both know writers that have gotten consumed by that idea of the big movie and the big to some idea that it's going to launch or continue their career, and nobody will have more worse any has anything worse to say about Hollywood, by the way, than Stephen King, who's had jillions of movies made, and he's got some of the worst stories ever. And if he has if he doesn't have the clout to control his own books and how they're made, I have no I have no prayer of it and and john you've been through it. It, it, it it's just it's just dreary it's just just good luck with the project adios you know but give me the money yeah well <laughs> <laughs> can't lose sight of that yeah <laughs> 
Well, we do have a few personal questions. Um, oh, God. I'm going. I'm <laughs> yeah, really, including music. I'm sure John knows where I'm going with this one. Um, first, we'll ask uh, from Byron Public Library, which took you longer, writing a manuscript or determining the top 100 songs for Davenport's iPod? Well, I, no, that didn't take long at all because, <laughs> because I, I spend all my time when I'm writing listening to music. And uh, my favorite band is actually the Chili Peppers, and and uh, and I don't like the Beatles, which which was one of the little gizmos in that list of the hundred top songs. Right. I mean, I really think that the Beatles are pretty, are, are were really talented, but they were pop people, and I was more of a rock type person, more of a, I like the Rolling Stones back in the in, in the sixties. Yeah. But the but the uh, but uh, I listen to music constantly, uh, and and not not classical music so much, but really uh, music that starts in the 60s and goes right up, you know, maybe to the White Stripes were like, were, you know, 10 years ago or something like that. Um, and, and, but the Chili Peppers are my guys and I, and I like to watch them, uh, you know, I like to watch them perform and I like to watch, I like to listen to their music. And so, uh, and that's, that's pretty much a constant. Uh, and, and that list was, you know, sort of a joke, but not entirely. <laughs> How about you, Carl? What do you work by by music? Or I, I do listen to music sometimes, and I I do like the Beatles, but I'm a big Stones uh, fan. I I saw them the last concert they gave before the pandemic. Um, I saw them down in Miami, and it was and I've seen them probably ten or twelve times in concert. It was one of the best shows. So I'm a Stones fan, and I I just listen to to, to, to rock and roll. Tom Petty was I was I was a huge and still am a huge Tom Petty fan. Um, uh, Carl, Carl has written a couple of songs actually that were performed by a major artist actually. But my, my buddy, the late Warren Zevon, uh, the great LA rocker was a dear friend of mine. And uh, we, we, I, did, I did lyrics with him on three songs and one of which he did on Letterman, which I count as a high career point more than my novels. The fact that, this, that he sat down and played, the song was called Seminole Bingo. And he, it, and, he, and, uh, and he and he played it on Letterman. So no, but there's music, and I have musical references as John does, and a lot of the, but and it, I think it, it helps me. I mean, I just think and it's also a selfish thing we get to do is we get to put the music we like in in uh, in our books. I mean, why not? It's our books. Absolutely, absolutely. Speaking of other books. Is there another kid novel in your future, in our future? Um, is, uh, let's see, is there another Virgil Flowers? Any plans for future trips into space, like Saturn Run? Probably not any more space books. Probably a Virgil Flowers books. One of my problem, problems with kid is that in the very first books that refer to the fact that he was uh, a special forces kind of guy in Vietnam. Well. Uh, uh, Hanoi, I mean, uh, uh, Saigon fell in 1975, so that's now 55 years ago, and so that would make Kid someplace close to 80, and, <laughs> and, and 80 year old guys don't make that uh, good of romantic uh, leads in novels, and so, so that kind of preys on my mind. I like the character a lot, but probably won't see any more Kid, unless he's in a Davenport book, which he has been a couple of times. Okay, sounds great. Well, I hate to say this, but we're coming to the end of this wonderful conversation between you gentlemen. Um, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? It's a, it's a terrific read. And if, uh, I'm, these are all John's fans anyway. I, I mean, everybody, everybody knows you, this is just as good as the rest of them. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just, I want to thank him for including me in this. He's, a, he's an old dear friend and an incredible talent. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, proud to be his friend. Well, I'm one of Carl's biggest fans. So, uh, um, you know, what can I say? I, and and uh, squeeze me, if you get a chance to read that book, read it because it will crack you up. Yes, it will. Well, I'm a great big fan of both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you also um, to Putnam Publishing, as well as all the technical people in the background to put this program on. We cannot wait to read Ocean Prey. Thank you. And the book that's coming out about Letty. Um, thank you for letting us in on that information. I wanna thank you again. I hope you all have a great evening.
Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you. Everybody.